Hi, and welcome to the uh, BDO uh, not-for-profit uh, reporting season update for 30 June um, 23. Uh, sorry for the uh, starting a little late. Um, hopefully you've all had time to get your coffee or cup of tea ready and uh, ready to get into an hour and a half of some quite interesting uh, learning and uh, observations. Um, before I introduce uh, the team today, I would just like um, to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners um, of the land, uh, wherever you uh, sit today, um, and pay respects to the elders uh, past, uh, present and emerging, and certainly extend our respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, that might be listening uh, in today. Um, so uh, the presenters um, for today's session, uh, obviously uh, myself, um, leader of our uh, not-for-profit uh, group uh, across Australia, um, Aletta, uh, who leads the IFPRIS um, corporate reporting, uh, ESG and sustainability. So obviously a very talented person, a lot of responsibilities there in that. So Aletta will be taking us through um, uh, the financial reporting uh, update. Um, we also have Chris who will be forming part of the panel uh, towards the end of the session um, and we'll be talking around some interesting cyber security work um, that he's been doing in the, the not-for-profit space. Um, Stephanie who's uh, people and advisory, uh, an expert uh, around employment uh, taxes um, and uh, has been doing some really interesting work uh, in that space recently around contractors um, and uh, a number of other things that uh, will affect not-for-profits. So uh, going through some of that. We have Leah, who's uh, one of our uh, audit partners, um, and I'll just be talking about how you might be noticing your audit uh, is a little different this year and, and explaining why. Um, and uh, Russell, uh, who's uh, um, one of our tax experts and, and uh, NFP experts, um, and maybe might bring to your attention some things that you're not aware of um, around the F uh, Productivity Commission Philanthropy Review and a few other things that potentially might have a big impact uh, on this sector, depending uh, what comes out of those reviews. So. Um, as we've done with previous presentations, uh, the last half hour or so will be those panellists just talking um, about some interesting things uh, that they've been seeing and doing of recent times. Okay, so we do have quite a bit to, to get through. So we'll kick off uh, with your, yourself a letter and the, uh, the financial reporting uh, update as such. Good morning, everybody, and, and morning, Anthony and fellow panel members. Um, I always love doing webinars with other people. Um, it's always nice to have more people on the call, more people to share insights and ideas. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the second half of the webinar where I can learn from the other BDO partners uh, from their areas of expertise. Um, and to all our not-for-profit clients and contacts, thank you for joining us. Um, for not-for-profits, um, you know, it's never a dull moment. There's always something on the go, always more things to do than we've got uh, time and money for. Um, we'll start off, or um, well, Anthony and I will start off by looking at some latest developments around accounting standards, financial reporting, sustainability reporting, and things to think about for 30 June 2023 uh, reporting season. So. Uh, basically, we've got six sections. Uh, we'll start with su sustainability reporting because it's really topical at the moment. Um, recently, we've held a number of events where we were reaching out to not-for-profit not clients um, and also meeting to our, with our not-for-profit clients and um, planning for upcoming audits. And the one message we received back from all of them is the importance of sustainability reporting uh, which includes impact reporting. So we'll touch on that. Um, then we'll give you an update on the AASB's proposals to simplify recognition and measurement in financial accounting for a potential third tier of not-for-profits, and they're making some progress, so we want to give you an update. There's also a post-implementation review 
um, ITC 50 on income of not-for-profit entities, our ASB 1058. And there's also some feedback on a post-implementation review around control, structured entities, related party disclosures, um, and you know the basis of preparation for special purpose financial statements, so developments. Um, we want to give you an update around accounting for non-refundable upfront fees, which we often see within the schools. Um, and then finally, an update on paper corn leases for private sector, not for profits. Um, so quite a lot happening at the standard setting level at the moment. Um, let's start with sustainability reporting and Anthony as always please feel free to add your wisdom and experience um, whenever uh, um, you feel appropriate I know I'm a bit of a steam train but I'll try and slow down here and there uh, but anyway you, you're very welcome um, sustainability reporting now in the past we we've put on the agenda listen sustainability ESG is more than just climate change it's more than just carbon footprint measurement it's more than reducing your emissions a sustainability or esg which we use interchangeably could be a lot of things there could be environmental aspects which we've listed here there could be social aspects and there could be governance aspects so i think it's important to come back to this and understand that um, although climate change and um, is really on the agenda and government is coming up with legislation and the International Sustainability Standards Board is coming up with mandatory reporting, um, it's only one part of sustainability. And actually within not-for-profits, we often find that the social aspect is the one that gets a lot of attention. And that is how we deal with employees, uh, customer satisfaction, human rights, diversity, and our data protection and privacy, cyber security, health and safety of our people and our clients, um, broader community engagement. So the social is often um, a ticket to play for not-for-profits. Um, governance, in a way, I would say is, is becoming a, a, a real um, non-negotiable that all organizations, profit or not-for-profit, have this in place. Um, so maybe the slide is just a reminder that system, sustainability is broad, um, it's not just climate change, and that it's important for each organisation to assess which of these factors are critical for them. And, and how do you know that? Um, the way to know that is to reach out to your stakeholders and ask your stakeholders what's important to them. And for a not-for-profit, an example, if your key stakeholder, or sorry, if you receive most of your funding from government through government grants, a government would be a key stakeholder. And if government would like you to report on diversity numbers, on customer satisfaction, on employee engagement, um, on data protection and privacy, then those are the things you should focus on from a sustainability perspective, because that could assist you uh, to obtain your government funding and keep your government funding. So it's important to say this is a broad range of things. These 24 items is not everything, but it's a, it, I think it's a good summary of all the topics, but it's to think which of these you should focus on in order to keep your funding to keep the private sector maybe giving you money, um, to give keep donate uh, um, donors giving you money. So who would be interested in your information? What would they be interested in? Um, so that's first of all. Um, and then Elena, you know, I might might just um, quickly add the observation there. We've had a, a few roundtables uh, across the country the last few months. Um, uh, with uh, not-for-profit directors and uh, CEOs um, and a common theme coming out is this certainly is uh, a focus uh, for them um, that they feel like they should be doing something in this space uh, looking at the reporting potentially opportunities in this space as well so it, it is on the agenda um, for a number of not-for-profits 
Absolutely. And, and Anthony, I think what people have also told us that it is no longer a nice to have um, because as our donors, government and um, you know, family offices um, and uh, private sector entities place bigger focus on sustainability, we expect that to push them through to their suppliers, to their customers and to the entities they donate to. Um, so this is really important to keep funds coming to not-for-profits, which absolutely what we want. So not-for-profits can keep doing the great work. Um, so some of the things that we've been doing and, and helping not-for-profit clients um, is, is developing an ESG roadmap because this is not something that happens overnight. There's a bit of a process involved and, and we're trying to make it a simple process, a manageable process. Um, by saying, let's start with your current state. What are you currently doing? Um, and a lot of people already and not-for-profits are doing amazing stuff already. So let's do a, a step one assess, or I would call it a stock take. Look at all your existing practices with an ESG lens on. And then in step two, we prioritize. And that's a materiality assessment. And that doesn't have to be, you know, over-the-top materiality assessment. I'm talking fit for purpose here. So materiality assessment, who are your stakeholders? Who are your most important stakeholders? Um, and rank them from top priority stakeholders to other stakeholders. How do we engage them and ask them what they are interested in? Because if we know what we've got, step one, and in step two, we know what our stakeholders want, in step three, we can commit to what we can try to do fairly easily. Um, in the short term, but also what we could commit to do in the medium and long term, because this is continuous improvement. Um, this is not we're all there immediately. Um, then in step four, whatever we've committed to over the short term, we can measure. And in step five, we can report. And then step six, we improve. Um, so I think this can be a very simple process. Um, it can be extensive for large not-for-profits, or it could be a simple process for smaller not-for-profits but there's there's a plan there's a roadmap um, and and i think that's important that we can at least disclose that we're doing something and what we're doing um, and, and that we've done for a number of clients then the next thing i thought i should do is uh, talk about sustainability reporting um, because if you look at sustainability reporting in australia i've tried to group it in two buckets where on the one hand we've got voluntary reporting in separate sustainability reports, which has been going on for a while. Um, and on the other side, we've got mandatory reporting, potentially in annual reports, which will soon be coming to Australia. Now, the, the voluntary reporting, you can look at various frameworks. The most common ones used are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or World Economic Forum, or the SASB standards or the GRI. <coughs> um, you know, and and they've got extensive metrics. You again pick the topics you want to report on and you comply with the disclosures for those topics. You don't have to report on every single topic in GRI, only the relevant ones, those important for your stakeholder. Um, and that will continue voluntary reporting, but mandatory reporting is the game changer. Um, and that is where the International Sustainability Standards Board is expected to issue their first two standards, IFRS S1 and S2, and S2 is the climate related standard and it's expected to be released on the 26th of June. Um, and that will mandate or the suggested mandating of sustainability reporting for years beginning on or after 1 January 2024. Um, but also the Australian government have indicated that they will have a similar timeline for Australia. Now they've consulted, they've received um, feedback. We don't know the final timeline, um, but we would say the latest would be 30 June 2025. So when mandatory reporting is coming at a listed entity level or at the bigger end of town or even in the private sector, the next thing that happens is everybody who transact with them, who receive money from them, um, who benefit from um, the money or the donations they make will have to come in line. 
because a lot of this reporting is focused on emissions, scope one, two, and three emissions, and everybody in the supply chain will fall in the scope three of potentially the larger end of time. So mandatory reporting is going to be a game changer, not only for listed entities, but only for also for not-for-profits um, in order to secure funding. And I think the, the link between voluntary reporting and mandatory reporting on the previous slide is illustrated well in this diagram published by the International Accounting Standards Board and the sibling organization ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, in that where we've always had traditional financial statements in accordance with IFRS, subject to audit the dark blue block, that will now be complemented by sustainability related disclosures, carbon footprint disclosures, scope one and scope two and scope three emissions, IFRS S1 and S2 will go in there, uh, and together those will form general purpose financial reports that focus on investors. And then the gray box we see will be the existing voluntary reporting, the GRI's World Economic Forum. Um, and over time, that sustainability related disclosures, the light blue block or the aqua block, will, will take over the gray block because as they issue IFRS S3, S4, S5, there will be no voluntary disclosures left, right? It will over time become part of the general purpose financial report, but it's continuous improvement. But I think this diagram nicely illustrates how it all fits together. Um, and ultimately the idea is to get all the information about an organization in the annual report in one place. So integrated reporting really. Um, so that's the plan. Um, so this is just a um, just to flag that in Australia there's been a consultation paper in December, uh, talking about what a Treasury is planning to do in Australia, um, and saying we'll follow the international uh, process. We're going to start with um, mandating a sustainability reporting. They want to phase it in, starting with listed entities or maybe just large listed entities, initially financial institutions, large emitters, but ultimately they would like all organizations who prepare and lodge general purpose financial statements to comply with the sustainability related financial disclosures. Um, and that will be somewhere between FY25 and financial year 28. That was the initial indication they gave us. They said we want this disclosures in the annual report, in the operating and financial review, so the director's report, um, and they would like assurance over this information. So maybe in the first year, no assurance, and then limited assurance, and over time, potentially full audit over these. Um, Leah and Anthony would um, be interested in that as audit partners, so it will build up to full, full audit over time. Um, but I think, What's important here, it's all about phased implementation. They're phasing the topics covered, so just starting with climate first. Uh, they're even starting with scope one and scope two and then scope three. They're starting with limited assurance and then full audit. They're starting with big entities and then all entities. So it's all about phasing so we could learn over time. So. I, when, if I talk about sustainability reporting, I use the words continuous improvement journey. Um, and really that's what it is about. Um, so if you're a not-for-profit, um, in the past, we would have said that strategic drivers for you to do something about sustainability would have been on the left-hand side, continue to have access to capital and donations, government funding, access to your to, to markets, uh, to clients, um, you know, especially younger generations, they, they want to engage with entities that have a sustainability strategy um, and then and people, people to work in your organisation. And we know there's such an absolute um, need for recruiting and, and, and keeping staff and that's for for-profits and not-for-profits. Um, so that used to be the only call to action or strategic drivers for action, it's access. But now we also have regulation added to that by the ISSB and also by ASIC. So ASIC is continuing to push 
again, for profits to better disclose business risk, climate risk and opportunities. But we know that often flows through to other regulators. Um, and then climate risk. We've seen in Australia the physical climate risk and also the transition risk. And the transition risk related to climate risk is how do a not-for-profit transition from our current high carbon economy to a low carbon economy? So how do a not-for-profit make sure that we use less energy, maybe use renewable energy, et cetera? Um, so these are the strategic drivers for action that we currently see. Now, a timeline in Australia could look like this. We're not 100% sure. We're expecting to hear from Treasury soon after the IFRS S1 and S2 is released um, later in June, but it could be mandated reporting 30 June for scope one and two, for example. It means you have to start collecting the data on 1 July and really to start to think, you know, what data do I need? What do my stakeholders want? And, and potentially thinking about that roadmap. Um, if we bring it back, Anthony, and say, okay, for 30 June, a letter, this is all interesting, but for 30 June 2023, um, what do we have to do? Um, there's two things that I would encourage you to think about really carefully. The one is TCFD recommendations. That is the task force for climate related financial disclosures, the recommendations, and the other one is measuring your carbon footprint and remembering this is a continuous improvement journey. So the TCFD recommendations have been in place for many years, but ASIC and other regulators, ASX, APRA, um, are continuing to encourage organizations to comply with these recommendations because the recommendations are linking risks around climate related issues and opportunities very nicely with your strategy, your risk management, and then finally, the financial impact on your balance sheet, your income statement, your cash flow. And this is a figure from that um, recommendations. The recommendations, there's only 11 recommendations and it's disclosure recommendations. And they're trying to get organizations to start to think, what are you doing around governance and then strategy and then risk management, and how do you embed risk management in your overall risk management? How do you embed strategy in your overall strategy? Um, and again, you know, governance, how is your governance for climate-related risk part of your overall governance structure? And then finally, what are your metrics and your targets? So you can't start with targets, but that is potentially an end result in a few years' time. Um, so the TCFD recommendations, if we have it all on one page, they are the four pillars and there's 11 recommendations. And while I would encourage you to consider this, um, you don't have to uh, comply with each and every one this year, but make a start and think of how you identify gaps and address gaps for next year. Because potentially in a year or two's time, when IFRS S2 becomes mandatory, and that would be more extensive disclosures than what we see here. But these recommendations will put you on the right path. Um, and it will be the messaging that your donors and governments would expect to see. Um, it is fairly uh, softly, softly describe your oversight um, at the board level, at management level, but there is one part that is more descriptive. And that is in the metrics and the targets column where they say disclose scope one and scope two, and if appropriate, your scope three um, greenhouse gas protocol emissions. Um, again, if you're not in a place to disclose that this year, at least make an attempt on what is scope one and scope two, get the training. Um, we're doing training from July onwards in our sustainability webinar series to help you with that but get the training, start to think how to measure it, what data do we need um, in order to maybe address scope one and two next year and potentially let's say scope three the year after. It's all about a roadmap, um, but the TCFD recommendations is a, a really good um, pathway to what's coming around IFRS S1 and S2. If you wanna look at scope one and two, um, we measure it using the greenhouse gas protocol, 
So it doesn't matter what reporting framework you use, the measurement is always the same greenhouse gas protocol. Um, we've got a publication out on it. If you want to have a quick look, it's a very short publication, I think four or five pages. Um, and then we've got extensive webinars covering uh, for the next six months, every month, we're just looking at the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, if I look at a sustainability reporting journey, I see it as these, these three key bits. There's measuring your carbon footprint on the left-hand side, and that will invariably flow into how do we reduce our carbon footprint, a decarbonisation strategy. And then we measure again, and then we adjust our strategy. Um, that then impacts your reporting because it's one of the things you report. The other things you're, you will report will potentially depend on your stakeholders. We know carbon footprint is important in the market at the moment. So what are the other things? Maybe it's diversity, maybe it's employee engagement. And again, how do we do that better? So there's a linked strategy. And finally, for Leah and Anthony's um, a lot of work, assurance over the measurement of that carbon footprint and sustainability reporting. So that's how the journey unfolds, or we see it unfolding. Um, I thought I'll, I'll give you a bit of an example, and it's our own sustainability report. Um, we launched our own sustainability report at the end of October last year. And this is just a snapshot from the report. And we looked at the World Economic Forum. It's a voluntary separate report. And we've included, um, you know, according to World Economic Forum, you look at your people, the planet, prosperity and principles of governance, um, which is aligned to the ESG. Um, you can look at that report in greater detail, but it just gives you an idea how BDO, as a professional services firm, engaged with our stakeholders. We list our stakeholders, we engage with them, and we even put in our report what our stakeholders said they want us to report on. And then you can see how we've responded to that. And um, so that's just to give you an example of what this could look at. And the roadmap I've discussed earlier is exactly what we used for our own sustainability report. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with an amazing team to put that report together using what we also use for our clients. So that's just a little bit of an example. Anthony, I'll just pause there for a moment before I go on to the more accounting focused topics, which is a bit of an update on latest developments. Yep, that's excellent. Thanks for that letter. That's all um, quite interesting. And as, as I said, it uh, feeds through a lot to um, uh, what we've been hearing um, from a number uh, of, of not-for-profits. Um, so I'd imagine a number of people um, found that quite interesting and obviously where, where to start um, and, and that uh, your point. And, and it's interesting, we lose sight of it a bit when we prepare a financial report because we see it as a statutory obligation, but even with our financial report preparation, it's important to be clear on who are our stakeholders and what's important to them. Hence, um, getting the messaging right in the financial report, but it's the same process with this sustainability reporting. Yeah, Anthony, you've actually made a fantastic point that I forgot to mention, and that is in the past, when this was all about voluntary sustainability reporting, the people who engaged with BDO and we had an opportunity to speak to were usually sustainability or often legal professionals, professionals looking at it from a risk perspective. But now that there's mandatory reporting coming and it's going to end up in an annual report, the people who are speaking to us and reaching out to us are CFOs, finance mm. team, chair of the audit and risk committee, um, because they're very aware that this information, the TCFD recommendation, carbon footprint, um, reporting to stakeholders um, is now in an annual report. It's a communication exercise. Uh, and it's therefore now their responsibility and in their wheelhouse. But there's been a big shift in the in the market or, or what we've seen in the market, Anthony. Yeah, so no, it's going to be really interesting to see how this evolves um, over the, the, the next few years. Uh, probably a bit more interesting than lease accounting and revenue accounting. So, uh, <laughs> so that's all good. <laughs> oh dear, nothing is better than lease accounting, Anthony, come on. <laughs> Okay. Well, we better move on. <laughs> <laughs> if I give you a, a bit of an overview, and I think um, 
some of you would be really interested in this. Um, the ASB is working on a proposed tier three for not-for-profits. Um, and this is interesting and, and not to be confused, by the way, this tier three um, with the three levels we have in the current ICNC requirements. So the, the ICNC currently have three levels around reporting. Um, there's large charities, there's medium charities and small charities based on revenue. Um, and if a large and a, a, a medium charity have to prepare financial statements um, and to determine which accounting standards are the large and medium charities have to comply with, we currently ask the question, is that charity a, not, um, a reporting entity or not? Um, and if it is a reporting entity, it has to prepare general purpose financial statements um, at a minimum tier two. It could do tier one if it wants to. If it's not a reporting entity, it could still do special purpose financial statements. And obviously a small charity uh, don't have to prepare and lodge a special purpose or general purpose or any financials at all. Um, so if you look at that large and medium charity, that currently consider whether they are a reporting entity or not, what they're trying to bring in is that all large and medium charity, um, large and medium sized charities will prepare general purpose financial statements. But to make it easier, there will be a third tier of general purpose financial statements. So where tier one is all recognition, measurement, and disclosure, and tier two is simplified disclosures, double ASB 1060. Tier three is something very new in the Australian market, simplified accounting. So simplified recognition, debits and credits, <coughs> and simplified measurement, right? So that could be a, a quite a game changer. So if you fall into <coughs> that um, general purpose financial statement tier three, um, and you qualify simplified accounting, um, there could be uh, a number of benefits. Um, so again, the ASB are not trying to dictate who is um, general purpose tier one, tier two, tier three. They still hold the view that it's for regulators to decide do they want to require tier one, tier two, or tier three financial statements or not, similar to their position for for-profit entities. It's for regulators had to decide. Um, so please note that this general purpose tier one, tier two, tier three, it's all general purpose. It's not the same as large, medium and small charity. That's the real purpose of this diagram. Then I thought I'll give you a quick run over of what they're thinking about. Um, I've been part of this panel where this has been discussed. It's gone to the AA's beat for the board. Um, they've made some recommendations and it's now out for review. We don't know where it's going to end. Um, so, you know, there's a, a statement of profit and loss, statement of financial position, statement of cash flow prepared using the direct method. There's no need for a separate investing and ca a financing cash flow section. And there's an option to provide statement of changes in equity or not. Um, a few things they are proposing to simplify the accounting. Can you believe it? Consolidation. Proposal that a parent entity could prepare either consolidated or separate financial statements. That includes information about the parent's relationships. And um, so I think consolidation has been a big sticking point for a long time. So that's one proposal. Income and recognition, simpler revenue recognition as compared to the new AASB 10, um, AASB 15. Um, so potentially no need to identify enforceable contract and sufficiently specific performance obligation. Um, they are suggesting that potentially you defer income if there's a common understanding between the parties on the use of the funds and the common understanding is evidenced. Um, so, you know, Anthony, we've just settled on the new ASB 15 and 1058, but here's another potential uh, adjustment to that um, if you're in that third tier. And then also non-financial assets acquired at significantly less than fair value, um, you know, for donated inventory, et cetera, there will be a choice to recognize 
at a cost, which is potentially zero, or current replacement cost, which is fair value. And remember, paper corn leases continue to be at cost um, after many years of talking about that. Um, so there's also some ideas around financial instruments, um, you know, for example, financial assets potentially at cost, except for those how to generate both income and returns. Um, financial liabilities potentially at cost, so not at the effective interest rate method. Um, impairment on an incurred loss model, not the new expected loss model in IFRS 9, and hedge accounting not permitted. Um, and if you look at impairment of non-financial assets, um, entities only have to perform an impairment test if assets have been physically damaged or when service potential has been adversely affected. So you know, narrowing um, those impairment um, indicators. Um, and then leases, my beloved leases, lease accounting to be kept off balance sheet, um, expense the lease cost on a straight line basis or other systematic basis. So that's back to the old AASB 117. Um, so these, this is what they're proposing to simplify the accounting um, for that third tier uh, of general purpose financials. Also, uh, accounting policies, errors and changing in estimates, no full retrospective restatement uh, for uh, voluntary changes, um, borrowing cost, expense, um, all borrowing cost as incur, even if it relates to qualifying assets, uh, where usually we would capitalize, um, you know, employee benefits, long service leave provisions will be an undiscounted amount. Um, and then the intangible assets, the AASB is looking um, for feedback on types that would exist for tier three entities, but before deciding on an approach. And I should just say, this is a difficult project um, for the AASB because um, they don't know the exact size of the entities that will be required by regulators to comply with this third tier. Um, so to, you know, to set standards that's fit for purpose for a, a little bit of an unknown, they've made some assumptions, um, but it could be difficult, you know, um, to identify what would be the types of intangible assets that would exist at the smaller end of size at, 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 at the spectrum. So it's not a small charity, it's bigger than that. So revenue is more than 500,000. So it's potentially revenue between that 500,000 and 3 million. Um, but you know, the, the, the industry is so diverse, really hard to predict, and therefore hard to simplify the accounting. Um, I actually think this is a very difficult project. Um, Elena, can, I might just make a comment around that because, and, and particularly those first two slides around um, uh, where potentially there'll be change. So, um, obviously, uh, say who the ACNC ends up deciding who is able to uh, apply this or not is going to be really key. Ignoring that, I'd imagine there would have been a lot of people uh, listening um, to this webinar thinking, oh, income recognition, that sounds fantastic. I uh, can't wait um, for, for that to happen. Um, and and there, there's a couple of others in there, but I suppose it's going to be important to remember that even though it might be simplified in these areas, it will come down to um, say who regulators like the ACNC decide this is who can apply this. Absolutely, Anthony. And, and you know, that is, uh, again, as I say, why it's a difficult project. Um, you know, we're expecting it will be more than 500,000. Um, I don't think it will be allowed for entities above 3 million. So we, we're working at that spectrum, um, but it's up to regulators to decide in the end. Mm, yeah, no, that, that's right. I just wanted to give you an idea of what's potentially coming. Um, you know, they are proposing to keep largely the same, the following areas on this slide. Um, so no significant changes. I think what they've tried to do is let's look at the real problem areas for our smaller not-for-profits and try and simplify it for them so we can get them to general purpose financial statements. So we now refer to general purpose financials for not-for-profits. They could be a tier one, a tier two, or a tier three. 
And for the first time in Australia, it, there will be a general purpose uh, tier that don't do all the recognition and measurement of full IFRSs, right? So it's a fairly new concept, actually. Um, and then also the proposed tier three reporting framework, um, they are proposing to exclude the, the following areas from the tier three accounting requirements. Um, and what they're saying, if you come across these transactions, we don't expect you to come across it in the smaller not-for-profit space. If you come across it, you can go and should go back to the normal IFRS dealing with this. Um, and just to, you know, keep that project moving. Um, then, Alana, uh, can, sorry, can I just say, um, given that you're involved uh, with the discussions with uh, uh, the people that are making decisions around these areas, if you could influence in any way uh, simplification of accounting for investments, because um, often that is an area where not-for-profits that do have investments and they're a mixture of different types, so direct equity, managed funds, um, interest-bearing uh, uh, securities, um, simplification uh, would certainly make life a lot easier um, for, that, for those NFPs. Yeah, and, and that IFRS 9 changes are definitely on the card to simplify that potentially towards cost, Anthony. So, mm -hmm. yes. Um, yeah. Now, uh, on that panel, we can raise some ideas, but, you know, ultimately the, the ASD make these decisions. Um, but the, I have to say the ASD has done a great job by including so many um, firms that help um, not-for-profits and not-for-profits themselves. They've really reached out extensively on, on the project. Um, they've done, I think they've done a, a good job, continue to do a good job on this project. Um, then there are some uh, examples here on how they could potentially simplify accounting, some um, examples, happy for you to have a look at that and the interaction with ASB 1060. Um, so the story so far, um, the comments on the discussion paper were due on the 31st of March. The AA has, ASB has received a lot of submissions and online, online survey responses, 263. Um, 73 stakeholder engagements, that's amazing. Um, and they've decided in May, just last month, to proceed with the development of an ED um, on this tier three for simplified accounting and removing the ability of certain not-for-profits to prepare special purpose financials. So remember, they're gonna remove special purpose financials for the smaller not-for-profits. Um, but in order to do that, they are not transitioning them to tier one or tier two general purpose, but to a tier three general purpose. So they want to get this tier three established before they remove special purpose financial statements. But it's important to know that this is on the on the horizon if this impacts um, your business or potentially impacts your business. Um, and then this is just a summary of some of the feedback from the stakeholders. I'm not going to labor this because there's so much to cover. Um, so that's just an uh, uh, overview of the regulatory framework, which I think is important. And um, if we look at uh, the post implementation review, we know, um, you know, we had a decision tree on whether to use ASB 15 or ASB 1058. There are a number of hurdles. And the very first hurdle to decide which standard to use on income recognition would be are the funds received for the purpose of acquiring or constructing a non-financial asset. And if it is, um, then you'll apply ASB 1058 paragraphs 15 to 17. Um, and, and that's always the first threshold question you ask. Um, now what's happened, we've identified some scenarios um, where there's been some questions raised around acquiring or constructing this non-financial asset. Um, you know, um, there, there are some judgments um, around, do we have identified specifications? Um, and, you know, when is it funds that we can use uh, to construct an asset? When is it for a specific uh, asset? So just be aware of that. And there's some discussion around that. And then in order to the next part, if you can pass that, a sufficiently specific has always been unclear and quite a, a lot of confusion still in practice. 
and we still need judgment to to work out um, whether we have an enforceable contract and whether we've got sufficiently specific performance obligations because only then we are within the scope of AASB 15 and again that does not necessarily mean we recognize revenue over time but it gives us a chance it gives us a fighting chance so we can still do the assessment so it's maybe just to raise a concern that sufficiently specific is still an issue um, but there's a more recent issue around acquiring or constructing a non-financial asset that we should look at that requirement quite carefully. It shouldn't be a general funding, um, but a specific funding. Um, so, do, so what are some of the issues? Uh, let's say a hospital receives a cash grant to acquire 16 intensive care hospital beds. Um, is that an identified specification that we could use double A's B 1058 paragraphs 15 to 17? Yes. Um, very specific what we have to do with the money. A not-for-profit with a single objective receives funding, construct a building to perform its operations. It's a bit unclear. The not-for-profit will need to use judgment to determine whether the identified specifications criteria is met. Right, so here's money to build a building to do your activities. It's a bit vague. And the last one, the not-for-profit receives a cash grant to build a building. No, there's no detail about the location and the size of the building. There's no minimum construction standards. There's no expected timing of construction. Therefore, you would not fall within a double A's B 1058 paragraphs 15 to 17. You would want to fall within paragraphs 15 to 17, because it gives you an obligation to recognize the cash grant as income as you expend the money on the construction, right? So this is an important one to look at and um, to make sure that that cash grant is quite specific in what you have to do with the money, what type of asset and timelines. So just wanted to put that one on the table. Um, the next one that we flagged were the one around sufficiently specific performance obligations. Um, remember, if we receive money to do activities that could be seen as internal activities, not ultimately going out as a service or a good that we provide to customers, you know, that is an internal activity. Uh, we cannot say we meet the sufficiently specific performance obligation. It's not a performance obligation. There's no service or good that we provide. Um, if it is an output, so there's an external output, there's a good or a service that we transfer to a customer, plus it's very specific, the hours, the timing, et cetera, um, outputs sufficiently specific usually. Outcomes, again, it's a bit of a question mark, it's a bit vaguer um, and a little bit of judgment required. Um, you know, on, on, on whether we could uh, look at, at that. So that's a question mark. So again, examples, if we spend money in accordance with the not-for-profits objectives, I mean, that's not sufficiently specific. Uh, if we have to provide counseling services over the next 24 months, uh, very difficult, unclear, but I would, leading to a no. Uh, the type of service is specified, um, the time frame is specified, but there's no real information about the recipient, the quantity, and importantly, how do we measure whether we've complied with this or not? If we provide 100 sessions in the first month, have we met this criteria, or is it 101 hour sessions over 24 months? You know, how do we measure progress? That's the problem with the middle one. And then if we provide counseling services to adolescents, affected by mental health issues in Melbourne. Um, the entity has little discretion over the type, the quantity, reception, uh, recipient and location of the services. Um, you know, so that's a bit tighter, but sufficiently specific performance obligations continue to be problematic and it's better to get it as tight as possible. Uh, some other issues, um, you know, some not-for-profits keeping two sets of books for income recognition. Um, you know, how do we keep the information and track the information better? Um, so it's in our non state you know, that's somewhat problematic. That's some issues that's been raised. Um, how do we account for arrangements in, in which the not-for-profit is acting as an agent? 
So often a charity um, or a foundation receive money that their only responsibility is to uh, pass that through to other organizations. Um, so in that situation, one could argue they're acting as an agent, like a distribution agent, and therefore should they be recognizing all that money as income and all the outflows as an expense, or should they just be recognizing as income and um, their administration fee that they collect for doing this? Um, so that assessment of whether or not for profit is potentially acting as an agent, which could have a big impact on their income number, is very important and problematic. Um, and then, <coughs> if you how do you account for grants um, received in arrears? Um, and the AASB has come out with a new um, staff frequently asked question <coughs> on looking at that, um, which is an important consideration again. So with the timing of your grant, the spending of the money, and the oh, sorry, the, 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 if there's a disconnect between the time the grant is allocated and the time you receive the money, sometimes you receive the money somewhat later, but it could be a somewhat earlier. How does that work? Um, and how do we line that up for accounting purposes? Um, and then a very big issue um, would be termination for convenience clauses on this slide. Um, and this is something that we are seeing, uh, I would say now that it's come to the profession's attention, um, we see it everywhere. Um, and this is where the grantor of funding has a right to terminate the funding without cause. So how do we account for that? So, um, you know, in the current economic environment, you've received funding and you've actually received the cash. But there is a clause in there that they can take back the money. Um, usually, I would say the unspent money. Um, they can take back the money if they so wish at any time without cause. And therefore, to, to recognise that as revenue or income, um, would be problematic. So the question is really, when do we recognize that liability that you potentially have to repay this money if the grantor come and ask for this money? Now there's divergence in practice at the moment. Some people say, if I receive money and there's a termination for convenience clause in the agreement, on day one already, we would say debit cash and credit a liability. Uh, because at any stage, if I haven't spent the money, they can come back and I have to repay the money. So that's a liability. Other people have said, listen, I'll only book the liability once the grantor informs me that they want the money back that I haven't spent. And so although there's divergence in practice and it's it's back on the agenda at the AASB, um, it's been discussed at length, um, still divergence, and the AASB is now addressing this as part of this um, um, post-implementation review. Um, our um, um, preference would be that we recognize the liability when you receive the money, um, because there's no way you can avoid repaying this money. So on day one, debit cash credit a liability, um, and you only would remove that liability as you actually spend the money. I would encourage you to look for termination without cause clauses in your current funding arrangements, they are far more widespread than we initially realized. Um, and then accounting for research grants, um, there's additional uh, FAQs and illustrative examples to deal with that, if that's your space, and then some public sector specific matters as well. Um, this one I'll look at really, really fast because I would like Steph and the others to contribute. And um, this um, ITC is looking at some issues around control, structured entities, related parties, special purpose financials. Um, you know, um, around control, how do you assess control where there's no ownership interest, et cetera? What are the implications of consolidations if we don't have ownership interest? Um, so again, it's on their radar to look at. Um, some other issues would be implications of structured entities. Voting rights is not a dominant factor. Um, how do you identify and gather information about related parties in the public sector? 
And there's some challenges on preparing special purpose financial statements and disclosing your compliance with recognition and measurement of Australian accounting standards. So again, there's a bit of an update the story so far, quite a number of written responses um, and they have not deliberated um, the feedback that they've received yet. Non-refundable upfront fees, again, uh, we've written an article on non-refundable upfront fees because the AASB has added an illustrative example, 7A to AASB 15 for not-for-profits. This is a very important illustrative example to have a look at. Um, and it really says if you've got upfront fees, so joining fees, enrollment fees, establishment or setup fees, so this could be a gym, a golf club, a school, et cetera, um, you should ask whether that upfront fee relates to a distinct good or service. Um, and if it is, you could recognize immediately if you've if they've actually provided the, you know, if you've provided that good or the service that's so distinct, you can recognize it. Um, if it doesn't relate to a distinct good or service, you'll have to defer recognition. That's a principle. But the example is very good. Please look at the new example. Peppercorn leases is just a reminder that we now have an ongoing permanent ability to recognize um, peppercorn leases at cost. We don't have to fair value them on day one, which is amazing. Um, Anthony, that was a real um, high level overview. I thought 45 minutes, but there I went again, 59 minutes. Um, I'll hand over to Leah, I think, at this stage. Yeah, that, that's excellent. Thanks uh, thanks for that letter. And yeah, I know we thought, oh, well, there, there's not a lot this year, but um, as always, there, there is more than what we uh, realised. And that was fantastic uh, to go through that. Um, so Leah has joined us now. Leah, I, I don't think your camera is, is working, is it? No, it isn't, unfortunately. And I'm not in the no. office to, I haven't been able to get it fixed. but um, I just wanted to share what we're seeing within the actual audit space um, and you'll probably be seeing us or having a few more questions from the audit team because there is a new audit standard that is applying, it's called ASA 315, but it requires us to reassess and document risks in a more detailed way for us to understand and document um, the processes for getting the general ledger completed and the financial statements completed. So you'll have more detailed questions from us so that we can clearly articulate your specific risks and therefore the specific audit or the plan procedures that we need to do. And the key thing, I guess, that we need you to remember is that we cannot assume, even though we've been doing audits with you maybe for a couple of years, um, we, we do have to address the specific risks but we're also needing to spend more time on revenue you know a letter has just gone through some of the the items that have been coming up in regards to revenue recognition but a number of you are also doing more as you address sustainability so you're introducing new revenue streams um, you're, you're also um, often entering contracts that are now more complex and non-standard, which requires the assessment of which accounting standard we're going to apply. And therefore we need to do the assessment with you or review your assessment of which accounting standards you know, are sufficiently specific, et cetera. And we're also typically spending more time on systems, processes, and IT platforms as a number of, um, Charities and not-for-profits are improving their efficiency and reporting by changing systems and we're required to reassess the risks and the IT general controls that are attached to that. So yeah, there's changes in accounting standards, but as you adjust um, within your own um, charities, there's then new audit risks that, that come up and therefore we need to address those. So that's what I'm seeing from an, an audit yeah. part yeah, no, and, and that's um, great, Leah, and, and, and it's certainly good because uh, it's not even though uh, we've been putting it in our completion reports um, to, to clients uh, last year about the changes coming up in audit standards and that they will see a bit of a change uh, around the audits uh, and, and probably more time spent at that planning piece. Um, certainly that's what we're going through uh, at the moment and it might explain 
um, why there's potentially some more in-depth questioning uh, around certain areas uh, by the auditors and might, might explain, explain why the auditors are a bit bleary eyed because uh, they are spending more time in this space uh, at the moment. So it was good to, to give that background. Um, Stephanie, uh, we might go to yourself now. So as I mentioned before, Stephanie um, is a partner in the people and advisory area, but specialising in particular um, around employment um, uh, taxes and expatriate uh, issues. So uh, Stephanie, I know you've got a few interesting things there uh, to look at. Thank you, Anthony. And yes, always lots happening in this space. I thought I'd begin today by just sharing a bit of an update on the Victorian state budget that was handed down a couple of weeks ago. Um, now, I've got some things on the slide. Um, some of the, these, I, I presume, won't be relevant to those of you who don't pay payroll tax um, for those who qualify for certain charitable exemptions. Um, but there are some interesting things in here and, um, and also the, the work cover change that I'd like to share, given that will impact everyone. So I think the theme coming out of the budget is that is looking at increasing taxes for those with an ability to pay. Unfortunately, Victorian government is in a lot of debt, so had to implement a number of measures to try to recoup some of that through additional revenue and additional tax liabilities. Um, the first change is around work cover premiums. This one takes effect from 1 July 2023, and what WorkSafe is seeking to do is increase the average premium rate from 1.272% to 1.8% for 2023-24. Um, the, for about, about 20 years or so, premiums have been pretty stagnant. However, the claims cost has more than tripled since 2010. So this increase is seeking to bridge, to bridge the gap between annual claims and the premiums collected. So unfortunately for all of you um, who have a, a work cover policy in Victoria, the expectation is there will be an additional premium from 1 July. For those of you who pay payroll tax, again, there were, wasn't a lot of good coming out of this uh, state budget. The only positive news is for small business with an increase in the tax-free threshold from 1 July 2024. So the threshold will increase to $900,000, um, which is bringing it closer into line to other jurisdictions. Second up point, though, diminishing threshold means if you do pay payroll tax, as soon as you're wages exceed a certain threshold, you will lose that threshold. So in Victoria, it'll be from $3 million, you'll start, start to see that entitlement diminishing. Once you pay wages of $5 million, you're basically paying payroll tax on every dollar. The additional um, chain measure that was introduced as well out of the budget, this is a, a big one for those larger um, organisations um, where you have national wages exceeding $10 million, you'll be liable for something called the COVID debt levy. And that commences from 1 July 2023 and is designed to generate revenue to pay off some of um, government's COVID debts. So the, it's imposed at 0.5% for wages in excess of 10 million with an additional 0.5% payable where national wages exceed $100 million. The sad news there is for those of you who pay payroll tax at these levels, or pay wages I should say at these levels, basically had a double whammy over the past couple of years. There was a mental health and wellbeing surcharge that was introduced from January last year. So that will apply in addition to this COVID debt levy. And then the next one, a very controversial one, it's the scrapping of the high fee paying non-government schools payroll tax exemption that was announced. It was um, announced to take effect from 1 July 2024. And essentially for those of you who, who um, are high fee paying non-government schools and you've got annual fees of $7,500 and more or more, that's kind of where the government had announced in their budget papers that the payroll tax exemption would be um, scaled back. Now, there has been some further um, commentary from Daniel Andrews just late last week following all of this controversy. Apparently, he's conceded that this measure will not raise as much money as forecast in the state budget, so it is being considered and reviewed. So I guess for those of you who could be impacted, um, watch this space. Um, there's more to come. Now, if we move on to the next slide and um, employees versus contractors, 
Um, this is an ever important distinction um, that continues to attract significant scrutiny by the regulators. There was renewed emphasis on employee versus contractor and contracting arrangements following two High Court decisions that were handed down in February last year. They were actually handed down on the same day, the 9th of Feb, it was personnel contracting and JAMSEC. What those decisions have done is place a um, more emphasis on the terms of a contract between two parties. So it's clarifying that when you're assessing an arrangement between um, two parties and whether it should be one of independent contracting or employment, the written terms of the contract in place is what should be considered and what should be relied upon in making a determination around the nature of that relationship. Up until these decisions, the focus was on the multifactorial assessment. So that's looking at those common law factors, which you might be familiar with, including who has control over how the work is performed, who bears the risk in the event of any defects, is the ability to subcontract or delegate the work, how is the contractor paid? So they're some of those um, factors that um, would, would be considered as part of that multifactorial assessment. However, Following these decisions, we would expect that all of those factors would be covered in the contract entered into between the parties. Where there are any of those factors that are silent, that's where you would need to look past the contract and um, look at how the arrangement actually runs in practice. So what happens if that determines an employment relationship between the parties? Well, you're going to have all employer obligations, including leave entitlements, etc. So if you're paying that individual, you will have to pay them through payroll, withhold, contribute super, include them in your work cover policy. And if you're an NFP that pays payroll tax, you need to declare those payments for um, payroll tax purposes as well. If an assessment determines that the nature of a relationship between two parties is one of independent contracting, this is where things get interesting because it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have employer obligations. Superannuation is the, the key one that I wanted to discuss um, today because this is the area where a lot of organisations don't actually realise there's an extended definition of the term employee in the superannuation legislation. So that extended definition provides that a person who works under a contract that is wholly or principally for the labour of the person is considered an employee for superannuation purposes. So if you're engaging individual sole traders, then this is where you will absolutely need to consider this provision, section 12 of the SG legislation, to determine whether you could in fact have a superannuation obligation for that individual, even though at common law, they're an independent contractor. Then um, some further things to consider from a work cover perspective, there are deeming provisions. So even if you've got, um, you know, the relationship is one of independent contracting, you'll need to consider whether that contractor is deemed a worker and you therefore have work cover obligations. And equally, the same thing from a payroll tax perspective, if you pay payroll tax, there's something known as the relevant contract provisions, which means you'll need to consider whether you do in fact have a payroll tax obligation. So lots to consider, um, absolutely not a, a black and white area. And that's why we're seeing more focus being placed by the authorities, including some further rulings that have been issued by the ATO. So I've set some out on the slide. Um, taxation ruling 2022D3 has been updated. That's a draft ruling that was issued late last year around um, pay as you go withholding and who is considered an employee. The ATO also issued a practical compliance guideline again, again in draft. It's uh, PCG 2022D5. That one is, um, it's a risk-based approach that the ATO has issued as part of that PCG. And basically what it does is it sets out some things to consider and how the ATO will approach these arrangements. So where will they classify an arrangement as low risk, 
very low risk, low risk, medium or high risk? And therefore, when should they dedicate resources to review these arrangements and potentially conduct an audit? So um, it is something to consider um, now that we've got some firm tests that the ATO will be looking at in terms of determining the risk associated with these arrangements. Now, those two rulings are currently um, going through consultation with the ATO. They are in draft. They closed the consultation um, or submissions to that process earlier this year. So we anticipate um, hearing more and eventually getting some finalised rulings. So the takeaways from here, as I mentioned, the subcontractor agreements is really important um, in relation to your procurement of contractors. So um, ensuring that they're well drafted, they actually reflect the manner in which you're engaging with your contractors and they cover off on all of the factors that um, uh, need to be considered as part of a multifactorial assessment. So again, good governance, processes and procedures around your engagement of contractors, including um, considering the broader employment tax obligations that could arise even when you're engaging with an indivi uh, individual contractor. And um, my final slide for today is just a little bit around wage and superannuation compliance. Again, another area which we can see, uh, continue to see a, a lot of focus. No doubt you'd be seeing um, you know, in the media on a regular basis, organisations who have underpaid their employees. Very often, it's not that an, an organisation wants to underpay, it's purely because of the complexity associated with the modern awards, with enterprise agreements, um, potentially a misconfiguration in an organisation's payroll system, which could lead to underpayments. And as a result, they get these issues arise. Um, so I wanted to raise it today because the SHADS award um, I expect would apply to, to many not-for-profits and that is a, an example of a very complex award. And I've just set out on the slide some areas where we see some, some complexity and they include breaks between shifts, penalty rates that apply depending on when employees are working, sleepovers, on-call and recall. Um, another update last week. Um, around um, annual wage review. So the Fair Work Commission has announced an increase to the award rates of pay by 5.75% from 1 July 2023. So that's something else that should be considered, particularly for those operating under an award, that those awards, um, will, you have to have your, your payroll system configured correctly from 1 July 2023. Um, and the national minimum wage has also increased. And then to wrap up from a superannuation compliance, some further updates there. The superannuation rate will increase to 11% of ordinary time earnings from 1 July 2023. There's been a number of increases in recent years and eventually it'll reach 12% from 1 July 2025, which is where the SG rate should stay for what I anticipate should be a while. Um, then to, if you're not complying with your superannuation obligation, so whether it's, you know, there might be an area in your payroll system, you've not paid the right percentage, or you've not configured something correctly, or you've identified a, a contractor where you should have actually been contributing super, there is a need to engage with the ATO and remediate that non-compliance. And in the event of non-compliance, there is a significant penalty that can apply. I've got on the slide um, that a penalty of up to 200% can apply in the event of superannuation non-compliance. So there is um, absolute merit to proactively engage with the ATO rather than leave it to, to um, potentially detection by way of audit. Um, I've set out a, a practice statement um, on the slide, PSLA 2021-3, and that um, sets out some examples of where there's the ability to seek remission of the SGC, GC, including that penalty. And a final update is, um, as I mentioned, the ATO is currently reviewing their rulings around the, the important distinction of employee versus contractor. One of those rulings is SGR 2005-1 and that ruling sets out who is an employee for superannuation purposes. That's currently under ATO review and we do expect that um, an updated ruling to follow in the coming, hopefully coming months. So that wraps up my update, Anthony. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was excellent, um, Stephanie. And obviously there, there's a lot in that, a, a lot of uh, to keep an eye on, of, of things to keep an eye on and maybe go back and uh, 
and check it. It does continue, doesn't it, to be an area where things just seem to come out, um, issues and whatnot, because there's a lot of complexities uh, around payroll. So that, that was a great update. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, uh, so welcome, uh, Russell. Um, <laughs> I think your update obviously will be quite uh, interesting as well around the uh, productivity commission and the review around philanthropy and potential implications of, of where that may go. Thanks, Anthony. Yes, it is uh, here in uh, Queensland, it's actually philanthropy week, something that's fairly unique to Queensland. So it's something that's very much front of mind at the moment. But the the topic of uh, philanthropy is uh, something that uh, the treasurer tasked the Productivity Commission to, to look at. And uh, they did a request for submissions and I'm not sure how many not-for-profits and charities uh, managed to actually have a read through. They issued 11 sets of questions, not just 11 questions, but 11 sets. And uh, so there, there was an enormous number of questions and they had a lot of throwaway lines in there about uh, um, should there be, or should should the deduction for donations continue, or should we have a different system? Um, should charities and not-for-profits continue to have an income tax exemption? Um, there was the question also they just throw away around, uh, or oh, there's is the question of competitive neutrality satisfied by not-for-profits being income tax exempt and. Uh, so whilst the submissions date has closed, I think the key thing that uh, all not-for-profits and charities should maintain a, a watching brief on is that come the end of November this year, they'll issue a draft report and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, that, that will be open for comment until the 9th of February, 2024. So it's going to be during that Christmas New Year period that uh, organisation is going to need to devote some time and resources to do it. Historically, in dealing with Productivity Commission, the key point is that uh, they, uh, that they, they do review what's submitted and, uh, and the volume and voice of uh, organisations will steer and guide that, that ultimate outcome. So it's important that everyone says, because the simple rule is if you don't make a submission, you can't complain about the outcomes. So, so that, that's just an awareness. Uh, the, the submissions that have been made are, are up on the website of the Productivity Commission, so you can have a look. There's a lot that you'll say, oh, that looks a bit similar, um, because a couple of organisations got their membership base organised and they did a lot of individual member ones, so there's a couple hundred submissions, uh, but there's quite a large number that have a fairly consistent theme. So, uh, so that, that's something to contemplate as well into the future. So that, that's on the Productivity Commission there, Anthony. Excellent, thanks uh, thanks for that, Russell. And I know when we were talking about this in the office the other day and you were uh, highlighting for us some differences between Australia and, and New Zealand and the way certain things are treated in, in the not-for-profit environment was, uh, was quite interesting because it, it kind of highlighted like who, who knows what the ultimate outcome will be of this, this review, but that, that's um, right, and yeah, you know, and and same as with Singapore, for example, at uh, the presentation this morning, it was highlighted that in Singapore, you know, for large do donations, you get more than the the 100% deduction um, to encourage higher levels of philanthropy, because the government there has recognised that the that philanthropy can solve problems that the government can't uh, fix. So. Uh, uh, so, so there, there's differing methods around, but in other countries, yes, it might only be a 20 cent deduction per per dollar of donation, and uh, and that can really stymie the uh, those on a top rate. That uh, you know, my experience is that everyone, the first thing they question ask is, is this a tax deductible donation? And yeah. uh, so it's something that a lot of people, a lot of Australians, really value. So it's uh, something I think we've got to ensure that at least maintains the 100 percent. Yeah, no. absolutely. And and was there a piece around the uh, income tax exempt? Yes, uh, and this will flow right in with uh, what Alette has been talking about. And uh, the, for, for the non-charity 
income tax exempt organisations. So that's entities that are under the Income Tax Act enjoy an income tax exemption under Division 50. Uh, things like sporting organisations, community associations, uh, that uh, trade unions, employer organisations, they, they all have the necessity to uh, shortly start lodging a, a document which the Income Tax Office is still developing, uh, but it commences for the reporting period from 1 July this year. And uh, so they will need to be able to evidence that the key tests in the Income Tax Act, I suspect, like all income and all assets applied solely to the purpose and objects of the organisation, the compliance with their key constituent documents, most generally their constitution. So those sort of questions will be there where you're required to put your hand on heart, someone from the organisation and say, we've done all these things. Speaking with the tax office, they expect there's going to be a number of organisations that may actually be charities and therefore as non-registered charities fail income tax exemption because they haven't registered and uh, also other organisations that perhaps don't qualify. So it's going to be an area that organisations need to give a lot of thought as to where they fit and to be ready to to use their financials as a demonstration of them meeting those, those key tests. Yep. Excellent. So a bit a bit to uh, keep a watch on in in that space. That's uh, great. Thanks for that, Russell. Um, I note that we we have seven uh, minutes left, and, and we're up to our our final panelist, um, Chris. Now, who uh, um, is a partner in the the digital tech and advisory um, area, and has been doing um, a lot of uh, cyber security work. Uh, in the not-for-profit space and I know from our round tables, uh, Chris, again, like I was talking about before, um, uh, cyber security is another one of those topics that's high on the agenda for a lot of directors uh, and, and CEOs. So um, uh, what you do in that space and, and how people get comfort uh, in that space I think will be of interest. Might be having a few technical issues there with Chris. Just while uh, Chris, uh, are you right there? Maybe. Yes, I started. I started. Yeah, yeah. Look, I turned my camera off um, because I think it's uh, chewing up too much of my bandwidth. So if if that's okay, I'll just speak quite quickly. Yeah, for a minute or two uh, with what we've got left. Yep, that's that's fine. Uh, I'll let you know if it does become a, a, a bit laggy, Chris, but yep, that's fine. Look, thanks. Look, it's been um, very interesting for me to listen to all the speakers today. Um, and what I've tried to do is, is break up the conversation from a cyber perspective into what I think are external factors um, that are pervasive for most businesses, including not-for-profits. And I, I've sort of highlighted four areas there where the pace of these changes is increasing. Um, in years gone by, when technology and other changes were being seen in other countries, we had a few years to get ready. It now seems like we've got a few months. And, and so we need to pick up the pace in how we're reacting to cyber threats because they're, they're pervasive. It's not a matter of, um, of if, but when. And what I'm seeing in, in general terms is there's a shift away from compliance using a, a self-assessment approach and it's becoming very pervasive and the obligations are increasing. And I think every speaker has emphasised that point um, without doubt. And I, and I also see, and I think everyone on the call sees that any, any business that doesn't comply with um, the Privacy Act and there's a breach, it's a potential brand destroyer. And, and in the philanthropic sector of, in which this topic is very important, it would be a shame to lose community support due to a, a, a cyber threat like that. So these are the external factors that I think people on the call should be increasingly become aware of 
if they aren't already. Um, after working with uh, a number of not-for-profits, I've seen a very high variability in the cyber and IT maturity levels. The, the bell-shaped curve is not bell-shaped. It is skewed to the left with a long tail to the right, and the long tail to the right represents a very small number of NFPs that I would say are business fit in this current environment. Usually I've seen IT run on the smell of an oily rag. Um, a lot of IT projects seem to have failed and businesses in this NFP space are, are shoring up the, the shortfalls in what they thought they were buying from a systems position, perspective with people. And people are volunteering their time they're doing the right thing, they're creating spreadsheets, but then they leave and there's a risk that the process leaves with them. And along with that, um, they're very resource constrained. A lot of the, um, the cyber strategies and IT strategies and business continuity plans are usually out of date and, and it's very manual in terms of business reporting. And what I've also seen is, there's a, there's a generally a low level of IT savvy on boards in this space. They don't have a strong digital cyber representative. There's a lot of really good people that have a very philanthropic um, ethos to be there, but I think it's time to consider specific roles and, and one around IT and cyber, I think is, is probably overdue. So they're the, they're the sorts of external internal factors I'm seeing. Now from a, how do you address these from a cyber risk perspective? Everybody has been talking about compliance in one form or another, which usually leads to reporting and you're reporting on a whole wave of different obligations, disclosures, and you've got to meet with legislation changes at a state level as well. So. The, the problem that I'm seeing consistently is that everyone's talking about data in one form or shape. And the quality of that data, generally speaking, that I've seen isn't where it needs to be, which is sort of counterproductive given the risks that we face and the obligations that we face to report um, that, are, that are going to increase. So, the focus that I see that would be well worth everyone thinking about is data quality. What is the governance management and the processes within each of your NFPs to manage data? There's no point in investing in um, faster compute, you know, easier access to, 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 to storage of data, because all you're gonna do is get crap data at the speed of light. And, and there's no need for that. Uh, it's not gonna help anybody. So looking at data, understanding where the data is across the organization and building a data lineage map will really help organizations with their reporting obligations and applying some digital smarts um, with analytics to make the reporting an, easy, an easier process is gonna be a big step in the reporting and the, and the disclosure space that we that we find ourselves increasingly um, being part of. So I think we're out of time, Anthony. Um, um, I'd, I'd probably like to leave it there because you've got questions uh, and et cetera to, to wrap up. Yeah, no, that that's fine, Chris. I, I, I know um, you, you have been doing uh, a lot of work, um, particularly with schools, and I'm not sure whether it's extended to, um, cyber penetration testing and, and whatnot, but then working with other NFPs. Is it common that, that when you go in and uh, you, you're doing the, the cyber work in relation to NFPs, there they're typically are shortcomings that you're picking up that where organisations are vulnerable? Yeah, look, so some of the biggest risks are even though you, you want to report on data, um, data breaches or cyber threats, a lot of organizations don't know that they've even been breached. 
and and that's that's the core problem so getting a, a cyber strategy understanding what your defensive position is going to be understanding what the posture of the organization is going to be and making sure that the board understands the risks that they face is is really step number one and what we've had to do is we productize some of the larger organization cyber services and package them for the NFP and school sector so that they can consume them and get the get the answers to these key questions as quickly as possible. You know, normally these things would take quite a lot of time and you can't afford to employ a cyber person in an NFP, but you could get a service um, that in a week or two gives you a current state assessment, exposes all the vulnerabilities, and gives you a roadmap. And then the board can at least decide what they're going to invest in and what risk appetite that they're willing to let things go because you can't you can't close the risk down to zero. It's just too expensive. Yeah, and I think that is a key point. You can't close the risk down to zero. So no, look, that, that's excellent, Chris. And uh, uh, thank you for that update. I know you are in transit, so really appreciate you. Um, taking the time to, to do that. One point that you did make there was that IT member on the board. Um, my observation is uh, boards are certainly in tune uh, with skills based. Um, and I, I know particularly for the larger NFPs, uh, ones that I've observed to have had um, a, a, a someone with IT skills sitting on the board has been very valuable because my observation is a lot of not for profits are spending a lot of money on IT upgrades and, and uh, different kinds of things and it's a continuous um, area and, and that skill set um, is certainly very useful on the board. Look, we, we are uh, out of time. Um, certainly if, if you do have uh, any questions, please uh, reach out to your contact uh, at BDO. Um, and they'll, they'll, if they don't know the answer themselves, they'll forward it to the relevant person and we will look come back to you. I could imagine um, some of those topics covered today uh, probably have raised some questions. Um, we will just uh, flick through these sides. There's a plethora of, of material um, that, that is available. Um, so through our, our corporate reporting uh, insights that we put out, um, monthly uh, webinars uh, that we do and training um, that we offer um, uh, and, and certainly some not not for profit specific webinars. Um, there is a, a lot of uh, information there, so um, I'll just uh, let a letter who's is sitting in the background there rolling through that to, to finish that. But um, certainly jump on our website. There's a lot of material there. Um, thank you uh, for the time and, and um, uh, dialing in today. I hope you've certainly found it useful and uh, certainly uh, a lot of thanks um, to Aletta, Chris, Stephanie, uh, Leah and Russell um, uh, for making their time available today and um, share some interesting insights. Um, please provide feedback uh, on this. Uh, we certainly uh, look to deliver what you're looking for so feedback um, certainly helps us tailor that and as Russell said, uh, if you don't provide the feedback, then you probably don't have a right to complain. So I like that. Thanks for that, Russell. Um, enjoy the rest of uh, your day and uh, until next time. Thank you.